Chapter 4 Cosmology What is the form of the world? The prince recited, Above are the heavens, abode of Indra, and the gods who sit around his throne. There, in the centre of the seven worlds, peopled by celestial beings, lies the milky ocean on which Vishnu sleeps, waking only when the earth grows overburdened with unrighteousness. Below, it stretches our earth, which would tumble into the great void if it were not supported upon the hoods of Sesha, the thousand-headed serpent. Further below is the underworld, where the demons, who hate the light of the sun, have their kingdom. The tutor asked, What is the origin of the four castes? When the Supreme Being manifested himself, the Brahmin was born from his head, the Kshatriya from his arm, the Vaishya from his thigh, and the Sudra from his foot. What therefore is the duty of the Kshatriya? The warrior king must honour men of wisdom, treat other kings with respect due to equals, and rule his people with a firm yet merciful hand. In war he should be fierce and fearless until death, for the warrior who dies on the battlefield goes to the highest of heavens. He must protect anyone who seeks refuge with him, be generous to the needy, and keep his given word, though it lead to his destruction. And my brother faltered, forcing me to offer assistance from behind the curtain. Forefathers, I hissed, vengeance. And most of all, Dri took a breath and continued, he must bring renown to his forefathers by avenging the honour of his family. Through the cause of the curtain I could see the tutor frown, the holy thread that hung across his bony chest quivered with agitation. Though he was alarmingly learned, he wasn't much older than us. The curtain was there because otherwise my presence flustered him so much that he was quite unable to teach. O oh, great prince, he said now, kindly ask your sister princess to refrain from prompting you. She is not helping you to learn. Will she be sitting behind you in your chariot in battle when you need to remember these important precepts? Perhaps it is best if she no longer joins us during your studies. He was always trying to discourage me from attending Dri's lessons, and he wasn't the only one. At first, no matter how much I begged, King Drupad had balked at the thought of me studying with my brother. A girl being taught what a boy was supposed to learn? Such a thing had never been heard of in the royal family of Panchal. Only when Krishna insisted that the prophecy at my birth required me to get an education beyond what women were usually given, and that it was the king's duty to provide this to me, did he agree with reluctance. Even Dhaima, my accomplice in so many other areas of my life, regarded the lessons with misgiving. 
She complained that they were making me too hard-headed and argumentative, too manlike in my speech. Dri, too, sometimes wondered if I wasn't learning the wrong things, ideas that would only confuse me as I took up a woman's life with its prescribed restrictive laws. But I hungered to know about the amazing, mysterious world that extended past what I could imagine, the world of the senses and of that which lay beyond them. And so I refused to give up the lessons, no matter who disproved. Now, not wanting to antagonize the tutor further, I made my voice contrite. A respected teacher, my apologies. I promise not to interrupt again. The tutor stared fixedly at the ground. Great prince, kindly remind your sister that last week, too, she promised us the same thing. Three hid his smile. Most learned one, please forgive her. As you know, being a girl, she is cursed with a short memory. Additionally, she is of an impulsive nature, a failing in many females. Perhaps you could instruct her as to the conduct expected of a Kshatriya woman. The tutor shook his head. That is not my area of expertise, for it is not fitting that a celibate should think too much on the ways of women who are the path to ruin. It would be better if the princess learns such things, and others as well, from the large and daunting lady who is her nurse, and who can, one hopes, discipline her better than I. I will recommend this excellent course of action to your royal father. I was dismayed by this sudden turn in events. No doubt my father, armed with tutor's complaints, would try once again to dissuade me from attending the lessons. Now, we'd spend a great deal of time arguing. Rather, he would rant and I would be forced to listen. Or worse, he would order me to stop and I would be forced to to obey. Additionally, I, re I resented the tutor's declaration that women were the root of all the world's troubles. Perhaps that was why, when he gathered up his palm leaf manuscripts and rose to leave, I pushed the curtain aside and gave him a brilliant smile as I bowed. The effect was better than I had hoped. He jumped as though stung. Manuscripts fell helter-skelter from his hands. I had to pull the end of my sari over my face to hide my laughter, although I knew there would be trouble later. But inside, a current surged through me at the discovery of a power I didn't know I had. Dhri shot me a remonstrative look as he helped the tutor pick everything up. Later he would say, Did you have to do that? He was being so difficult. And all those things he accused women of, you know they are not true. I had expected my brother to agree, but instead, he gave me a considering look. With a shock, I realized that he was changing. Besides, it was just a smile, I continued, but with less confidence. The problem with you is, you're too pretty for your own good. 
It'll get you into trouble with men sooner or later if you're not careful. No wonder father's been worrying about what to do with you. I was surprised first at the news that my father spared me any thought and second at my brother's compliment, backhanded though it was. Dri never commented on my looks, nor did, nor did he encourage me to comment on his. Such useless talk, he believed, made people vain. Was this another sign of change? But I merely said, How is it that father never worries about you? Is it because you're so ugly? My brother refused to rise to the bait. Boys are different from girls, he said with stolid patience. When will you accept that? In revenge, the tutor shot a last comment at me from behind the safety of the door that led to the passage. Prince, I have recalled one rule of conduct which you may tell your sister. A Kshatriya woman's highest purpose in life is to support the warriors in her life. Her father, brother, husband and sons. If they should be called to war, she must be happy that they have the opportunity to fulfill a heroic destiny, instead of praying for their safe return. She must pray that they die with glory on the battlefield. And who decided that a woman's highest purpose was to support men? I burst out as soon as we were alone. A man, I would wager. Myself, I plan on doing other things with my life. Dri smiled, but half-heartedly. The tutor wasn't totally wrong. When I leave for the final battle, that's what I'd like you to pray for. The word moved over me like a finger of ice. Not if, but when. With what chill acceptance my brother spoke it, he left the room before I could contradict him. I thought of the husband and sons that everyone assumed I would have some day. The husband I couldn't visualize but the sons I imagined as miniature versions of Dri, with the same straight, serious eyebrows. I promised myself I'd never pray for their deaths. I'd teach them instead to be survivors. And why was a battle necessary at all? Surely there were other ways to glory, even for men. I'd teach them to search for those. I wished I could teach this to Dri as well, but I feared it was too late. Already he had started thinking like the men around him, embracing the world of the court with open arms. And I, each day I thought less and less like the women around me. Each day I moved further from them into a dusky solitude. Dri was given other lessons, though these I couldn't share. Late mornings he fought with sword and spear and mace with the commander of the Panchal army. He learned to wrestle, to ride horses and elephants, to manage a chariot in case his charioteer was killed in battle. From the Nishad who was my father's chief hunter. He learned archery and the ways of forest people, 
how to survive without food or water, how to read the spoor of animals. In the afternoons, he sat in court and observed my father dispensing justice. Evenings, for a king must know how to use his leisure appropriately, he played dice with other noble-born youth or attended quail fights or went boating. He visited the homes of courtesans where he partook of drink, music, dance and other pleasures. We never discussed these visits, though sometimes I spied on him when he returned late at night. His lips reddened from alaktaka, a garland around his neck. I spent hours imagining the woman who had placed it there, but no matter how much sura he drank or lotus fibre he ate, each morning my brother was up before daybreak. From my window I would see him bathe, shivering in the cold water he insisted on drawing himself from our courtyard cistern, ignoring Dhaima's remonstrations. I would hear him chanting prayers to the sun. O great son of Kashyap, colored like the hibiscus, O light of lights, destroyer of disease and skin, I bow to you. And then, from the Manu Samhita, He who has not conquered himself, how will that king conquer enemies? Some evenings, Dhri didn't go out. Instead, closeted in with one minister or another, he learned statecraft, the art of preserving a kingdom, of strengthening its borders, of allying with other rulers, or subduing them without battle, of recognizing spies who may have wormed their way into the palace. He learned also the differences between righteous and unrighteous war and when to use each. These were the lessons I most envied him, the lessons that conferred power. They were the ones I needed to know if I were to change history. And so I cajoled Dri shamelessly forcing him to share reluctant bits with me. In righteous war, you fight only with men that are your equal in rank. You don't attack your enemies at night or when they are retreating or unarmed. You don't strike them on the back or below the navel. You use your celestial astras only on warriors who themselves have such weapons. What about unrighteous war? You don't need to know about that, my brother said. I've told you too much already. Why do you want all this information anyway? One day I said, Tell me about celestial astras. I didn't think he'd agree, but he shrugged. I guess there's no harm in telling you, since you'll never have anything to do with them. They are weapons that must be invoked with special chants. They come from the gods and return to them after being used. The most powerful ones can be used only once in a warrior's lifetime. Do you have an astra? Can I see it? They can't be seen. Not until you have called them. And then you must use them right away. Otherwise their power 
might turn against you. They say that some, like the Brahmastra, wrongly used, can destroy all of creation. In any case, I don't have any. Not yet. I had my suspicions about the existence of such astras. They sounded too much like the tales old soldiers would make up to impress novices. Oh, they're real enough, he said. For instance, when Arjun captured our father, he used the Raju Astra to enclose him in an invisible net. That's the reason the Panchal forces couldn't rescue him, even though he was only a spear's length away. But very few teachers know the art of summoning them. That's why father decided that when the time is right, I must go to Drona in Hastinapur and ask him to accept me as his student. I stared at him in shock. Surely he was joking, but my brother never joked. Finally, I managed to say, Father has no right to humiliate you in this way. You must refuse. Besides, why would Drona agree to teach you when he knows you'll use the knowledge to try and kill him? He'll teach me, my brother said. He must have been tired, for he sounded bitter, which was rare for him. He'll teach me because he's a man of honor, and I'll go because it's the only way I can fulfill my destiny. I don't wish to imply that King Drupad neglected my education. An unending stream of women flowed through my apartments each day, attempting to instruct me in the 64 arts that noble ladies must know. I was given lessons in singing, dancing, and playing music. The lessons were painful, both for my teachers and me, for I was not musically inclined, nor deft on my feet. I was taught to draw, paint, sew, and decorate the ground with age-old auspicious designs, each meant for a special festival. My paintings were blotchy, and my designs full of improvisations that my teachers frowned at. I was better at composing and solving riddles, responding to witty remarks and writing poetry. But my heart was not in such frivolities. With each lesson, I felt the world of woman tightening its noose around me. I had a destiny to fulfill that was no less momentous than Dree's. Why was no one concerned about preparing me for it? When I mentioned this to Dhaima, she clicked her tongue with impatience. Where do you get all these notions, your destiny as important as the princess? She rubbed Brahmi oil into my scalp to cool my brain. Besides, you don't know. A woman must be prepared for her destiny in a different way. Dhaima herself taught me the rules of comportment. How to walk, talk and sit in the company of men. How to do the same when only women are present. How to show respect to queens who are more important. How to subtly snub lesser princesses. How to intimidate the wives of my husband. I don't need to learn that, I protested. My husband won't take another wife. I'll make him promise that before I marry him. Your arrogance, girl. 
she said, is only exceeded by our optimism. Kings always take other wives, and men always break the promises they make before marriage. Besides, if you're married off like Panchal's other princesses, you won't even get a chance to talk to your husband before he bets you. I drew in a sharp breath to contradict her. She gave me a challenging grin. She relished our arguments, most of which she won. But this time I didn't launch into my usual tirade. Was it a memory of Krishna, the cool silence with which he countered disagreement, that stopped me? I saw something I hadn't realized before. Words wasted energy. I would use my strength instead to nurture my belief that my life would unfurl uniquely. Perhaps you're right, I said sweetly. Only time will tell. She scowled. It wasn't what she was expecting. But then a different kind of grin appeared on her face. Why, princess, she said, I do believe you are growing up. The day Dhaima told me I was ready to visit my father's wives to test my social skills, I was surprised by the excitement that surged through me. I hadn't realized how much I craved companionship. I'd long been curious about the queens, especially Sulochana, who flitted elegant and bejeweled along the periphery of my life. In the past, I had resented them for ignoring me, but I was willing to let go of that. Perhaps, now that I was grown, we could be friends. Surprisingly, although the queens knew I was coming, I had to wait a long time in the visitor's hall before they appeared. When they did arrive, they spoke to me stiffly in brief inanities and wouldn't meet my eyes. I drew on all my speaking skills, but the conversations I began soon disintegrated into silence. Even Sulochana, whose blithe grace I had so admired during the festival of Shiva, seemed a different person. She responded to my greetings in monosyllables and kept her two daughters close to her. But one of them, a charming girl of about five years with curly hair and her mother's shining complexion, squirmed away from Solochina and ran to me. Her eye must have been caught by the jeweled peacock pendant I wore. I'd dressed with care for the visit, for she put out a finger to touch it. I lifted her onto my lap and unclasped the chain so she could play with the pendant. But Sulochna snatched her away and slapped her so hard that red finger marks marred the child's fair cheek. She burst into bewildered tears, not knowing why she was punished. I stared at the queen in shock, my own face tingling with shame as though I were the one who had been slapped. Soon afterwards, Sulochana retired to her chambers with excuses of ill health that were clearly false. When we reached my rooms, I couldn't hold back my tears. What did I do wrong? I asked Dhaima, as I wept against her ample bosom. You did fine, 
arrogant cows. They are just scared of you. Of me? I asked, startled. I hadn't thought of myself as particularly fearsome. Why? She pressed her lips together, angrier than I'd ever seen her. But she couldn't or wouldn't give me an answer. I began to notice things, though. My maid servants, even those who had been with me for years, kept their distance until summoned. If I asked them anything of a personal nature, how their families were, for instance, or when they were getting married, they grew tongue-tied and escaped from my presence as soon as they could. The best merchants in the city who routinely visited the apartments of the queens would send their wares to me through Daima. Even my father was uneasy when he visited me and rarely looked directly into my eyes. I began to wonder whether Dree's tutor's nervousness at my interruptions had a less flattering cause than my beauty, and whether my lack of friends and visitors was due not to my father's strictness, but to people's wariness of someone who wasn't born like a normal girl, and who, if prophecy was correct, wouldn't live a normal woman's life. Did they fear contagion? Already, the world I knew was splitting in two. The larger part, by far, consisted of people like Sulochana, who couldn't see beyond their little lives of mundane joys and sorrows. They suspected anything that fell outside the boundaries of custom. They could, perhaps, accept men like Dri, who were divinely born, to fulfill a destiny shaped by the gods. But women, especially women who might bring change, the way a storm brings the destruction of lightning, all my life they would shun me. But the next time I promised myself as I wiped my angry tears, I would be prepared. The other group consisted of those rare persons who were themselves harbingers of change and death, or those who could laugh at such things. They wouldn't fear me, though I suspected they may, might well hate me if the need arose. So far, I only knew of three such people. Three and Krishna and Dhaima, transformed by her affection for me. But surely there were others, as I chafed in my father's palace. I longed to find them, for only they could provide the companionship I ached for. I wondered how long I would have to wait before destiny brought them into my life, and I hoped that when it did so, one of them would become my husband.